Um, so if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, uh, please try to stay away from from being highlighted in our in our in our video. In our video. Um, this will be posted on our website. We're posting all of our uh, presentations from this year and from now on on our website. And uh, it's uh, as an historian, I, it's it's a uh, sort of second nature to me to archive things. So we're just going to be archiving the things that, that we do. So uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Patrick Bar Melech, and I am professor of Latin American history at Ohio University, and it's my honor as well to be leading the Center for International Studies. Uh, it's also an honor and indeed a great pleasure to be the MC and moderator for this afternoon's discussion featuring our three esteemed guests. In line with our mission to educate globally engaged citizens and contribute to peace and justice in the world, in November 2020, the Center for International Studies announced its Black Lives Matter and Global Racial Justice Initiative an integrative and evolving commitment to addressing racism and its many manifestations in the United States and abroad. The initiative began with our position paper titled Black Lives Matter, the Center for International Studies position on social justice and equity, which is both uh, a statement of principles and an action plan. Uh, you can find it on our website quite prominently. Reflecting and requiring the imperatives of theory and practice, the position paper prompts us to consider and respond to fundamental structures, practices, and sensibilities that inform racism, racial discrimination, and other manifestations of racial inequity, which range, as we know, from the subtle to the stark. Upon the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis on May 25th, 2020, the center's team and some allies began meeting to discuss the incident and its implications and historical context. And I can't go without noting, of course, that we meet today as the trial of Officer Derek Chauvin continues in Minneapolis. As we gather weekly online in the spring and through the summer of 2020, we grew convinced that any statement made by CIS required much introspection as a group and also as individuals and would serve as but the beginning of a sustained and complex conversation in regard to issues of racism and anti-racism, Black Lives Matter, and its domestic and global implications, and academically inspired avenues for change. Today's discussion of Black Lives Matter, Matter from global perspectives and in global contexts is the first in a series that will continue in the fall. We are inviting accomplished scholars and friends from around the world to reflect on global, regional, and local phenomena related to Black Lives Matter and racial justice. We have heard voices around the world express solidarity with BLM, often in the context of violence and discrimination in their own countries against people of color. From moments of silence before Premier League soccer matches in England to protests in Brazil and Kenya and beyond, those voices are loud and clear and we in CIS have heard them, hence this series of panels dedicated to global perspectives and context. Like the position paper and our initiative, today's event is a collective effort. So I'd like to thank uh, Bose Maposa, our Assistant Director for Graduate Programs, uh, Dr. Kat Kutcher, our Assistant Director for Undergraduate Programs, uh, Bree Dowler, our Administrative Specialist, and CIS Program Directors and faculty members of the Center for their work and their support. Indeed, to everyone associated with our position paper initiative and today's event, you have our gratitude. We will begin this afternoon with opening remarks from each of our contributors who will bring global and national perspectives to the fore. We'll follow with a conversation uh, among participants about points raised and perhaps a few questions from me will be sprinkled in. We will then engage in a Q&A with you, our audience. If you wish to ask a question, please post that question in the meeting's chat. I will be monitoring the chat and I will relay posted questions to our panelists. I'll get to as many questions as possible. Please forgive me if I can't get uh, to yours. So I'd like to introduce our guests today. Dr. Aja Bowakie Bowatan is an associate professor and chair of the Interdisciplinary International Studies Department at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. He earned his PhD in Educational Studies with an emphasis in Cultural Studies and Education, his MA in Political Science and International Relations, and MA in African Studies, all from Ohio University. 
He earned his BA in social work administration and political science from the University of Ghana, Legon. Uh, a US Fulbright scholar and a Carnegie, uh, a Carnegie African diaspora fellow, Dr. Boyake Boatin is also a lifelong member of Phi Beta Delta Honor Society. His research interests include decolonial options, the construction of African philosophical thought, effects of colonialism on African aesthetics, and the transformation of indigenous cultures through global engagement. Dr. Dene Mupotsa is senior lecturer in African literature at the University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. She holds a BA in Africana Studies and Women's Studies from Luther College, a BA in Gender and Transformation, and a Master's of Social Science degree in Gender Studies from the African Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town. She holds a PhD in African Literature from the University of Witwatersrand. Dr. Mopoza specializes in gender and sexualities, black intellectual traditions and histories, intimacy and effect, and feminist pedagogies. She is a member of the editorial collective of Agenda, sits on the editorial board of the Brill series in youth cultures, and serves on the executive board of the International Girlhood, Girlhood Studies Association. In 2018, she published her first collection of poetry titled Feeling and Ugly. The Portuguese translation was published in 2020 by Editora Trinta Zero. Dr. Suen Caulfield is Associate Professor of History at the University of Michigan, where she is the former director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and currently heads the Brazil Initiative Social Sciences Cluster. She received her PhD from New York University. Dr. Caulfield specializes in the history of modern Brazil with emphasis on gender and sexuality. She has won awards and fellowships from the Fulbright Commission, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Council of Learned Societies. Her publications include In Defense of Honor, Morality, Modernity, and Nation in Early 20th Century Brazil, the co-edited volume Honor, Status, and Law in Modern Latin American History, and various articles on gender and historiography, family law, race, and sexuality in Brazil. Her current research focuses on family history with a focus on paternity and legitimacy in 20th century Brazil. She is particularly interested in questions of human rights in Latin America and has participated in a number of workshops, cross country teaching projects and exchanges around uh, topics of social justice and social action. So we welcome them wholeheartedly to our event and we'll begin with Dr. Boakia um, Boatin. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Doc, Dr. Patrick, and uh, thank you, Center for International Studies, um, for organizing this. Thank you, Jose, um, and I, I I appreciate the invitation to come and share some few um, of my thoughts about global um, nature of Black Lives Matter movement. I want to begin by, as Dr. Patrick already said, acknowledge the um, the trial that is going on currently um, for the murder of um, George Floyd. And one of the things that I've been thinking about this this particular um, um, gruesome incident is the idea that, um, in spite of the glaring nature of of the murder which was committed in full glare of the public, um, the, the accused found it prudent to have faith in the American judicial system to actually go and defend himself in spite of what we all saw. And this brings to me the idea that Black Lives Matter indeed has gone through a historical period of consistent inst institutionalized dehumanization. And I will show you in the next few minutes how, the, how this process of dehumanization started and continues to be part of the existence of Black people globally, um, even in the 21st century. So, Black Lives Matter movement, next slide, has become a galvanizing movement in resistance to 
the continued dehumanization of black bodies. And so how did this start? Because most folks may think that this is just accidental. I claim that this has been very well institutionally um, orchestrated. So what are the roots and routes of these black dehumanization? Next slide. Mbembe says this, next slide, Mbembe says this very um, poignantly, that blackness and race have played multiple roles in the imaginaries of European societies. This simply is that Europe created a world where the black person, the black body, was not seen as an equal human for human coexistence. The black body was seen as less than, was not fully human yet. And so they have built an inst they have built institutions to control this narrative of black non-humanness. Next slide. The founding documents that set out the the twenty the, the um the modern Europe the modern society orchestrated by Europe is through what the most scholars are we call the, the papal bulls. The papal bulls, these are edicts, I call them legal instrumentation that the Pope issues which directs its members as to how to engage and operate. And this document founded or was the, was the prefix or the, the, the general institutional justification for the birth of Europe and the birth of the other. And this particular document pushes the Europeans, from the Portuguese and the Spaniards, basically to invade, to search out, to capture, vanquish, subdue all Saracens and pagans, whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ, and then reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. So anyone the European encountered in the 15th century who was not of European descent, who was not white, was either a pagan, or Saracen, or somebody else. And that other was created with the idea that they would be subjected to perpetual slavery. These founding documents were taken to Africa and other indigenous lands, including the Americas. Once you establish this Manichaean world, next slide, you begin to see the racial dichotomization, which is that if you were Christian, you were good, the same with European and the same with the master. The other side is that you were Saracen, you were evil, you were African, you were a slave. The result of this imposed social world order it's a radical division of power relations based on extreme unequal dichotomies. So if the second term in each of the pair is considered negative, is considered corrupt, is considered undesirable. And so when Chauvin encounters Floyd, all of these second terms come to play. He views him as negative, he views him as corrupt, he views him as undesirable, and so putting his knee on his neck for nine minutes, 29 seconds, doesn't even cross his mind that we're dealing with a human being. Next slide. And Fernand also talks about this dichotomization in relation to the scramble for Africa, the colonial world, and the civilized mission. That on the on my on my on my left side you have to be good, you have to be Christian, you have to be European, master, white, civilized. On the other side, it's evil, pagan, Saracen, African, native, slave, black, non non non-civilized. 
And this compartmentalized world, a world divided in two, the natives, the, the native, the, the sector that, that identifies the native, is not complementary of the European sect. That the two confront each other, but not in service of a higher unit. This compartmentalized world, this world divided in two, is inhabited by different species. When they come into contact, there is this natural superiority that is exerted by the European over the other. And this manifests in, our, in the laws, this manifests in the way they treat our, the other. This is manifested in many other aspects of, of, of the existence of the non-European, the African particularly. Next slide. So that the bull Roman pontifex ordered a Christian violence against non-Christians, pagans, and then he said sub subdued them, imposed Christianity as the superior and dominant spirituality, it inferiorized African spiritualities and their cosmologies, making them negative and corrupt, and viewed non-Europeans, non-Christians, Afro-Muslims, and practitioners of traditional spiritualities as people without religion. Then we see a race as organizing, next, next slide please, we see race as the organizing principle of our, of our modern global system. This institutionalized version of violence of white against black, it imposes whiteness as a superior race, inhibiting what Fanon calls the zone of being. So if you are white, you exist in the zone of being. If you are black, you exist in the zone of non-being. And these different dichotomies do have different forms of, um, of actions and behaviors and existence that is extended to you. Next two slides, please. So I just want to show you quickly the, the zone of being and the zone of non-being. And as the boy said, you know, the, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The, color, the problem of the color line has been the problem since the 15th century. And so you see Europe, white, Christian, human, civilized, superior, yes, on the, on the, on the, on the zone of being. And then the other, the non-European, the African, the native, they exist in the state of inferiority, uncivilized, barbarian, savages, in the zone of non-being. And once we operate with this idea of a world where we see racial, institutionalized racial dichotomization, then it is no surprise to see a natural reaction by black folks screaming and saying that we are human. We deserve to be treated as humans. But before we, we even get into these conversations, it's important to understand the historical basis of how this came to be. And so that's, where I'm, that's where I am with this. So go to the next slide. Let me show you something real quick as I wrap up. So this is the Cape Coast Castle Dungeons. So what the upper side, it's the, it's the white side where it is where the Europeans live. This is the zone of being. Remember, if you were human, you existed on this side. Let's go to the next two slides. The next two slides. This is the zone of non-being. This is where enslaved folks were kept in these dungeons for weeks. And right on top of them, you will find the Europeans praying to their God. And so right from the answer, the introduction of Europe into in the introduction of imperialist ideologies in, in uh, of Europe into native lands set up this dichotomy where the human, the black body was not human enough. Next slide. So now you have to create institutions, epistemologists, cosmologists to support that. Because you cannot say, see a human being and say the human being is non-human. 
But you, if you claim so, then you have to build an institutional structure to support that. And so throughout European epistemologies, they have built a foundation of intellectual narrative to support the idea that these folks are not human enough. So that to be, to be a Negro, as they call the black person, was to be naturally inferior to white folk. Next slide. All these great European philosophers are writing to exalt the idea of whiteness and its superiority, and then to subject black bodies to the idea that they are not human enough. Next slide. So when I hear, when I when I engage with other other European scholars and others other other fine scholars of Europe, and they talk about the ideas of the the the, the great intellectual founders, I, I always have to pose the question: What does that mean? Because these great founders, these great philosophical minds, did not see black folk as worthy enough that they were not human. And once you have set up the premise that black folk were not human. You have to build institutions to follow that. And so we see right from the 15th century till now, we have seen mobilized resistance to this idea that black folk are not human. We see it in the Haitian Revolution. We saw it in the rebellions on the slave ship. We've seen it in the, in the, in the massive um, revolutions, resistance movement, um, in, in, the, in, in the Caribbean plantations, we've seen it in, in, the, in, the, in the continental United States. And so black folk have never been silent and passive to their, to, 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 um, to their oppression. They have always been part of finding solutions to, and to, to, um, to assert their humanity, to resist the labeling of being non-human, and what happened last year is simply a continuation of a global movement towards decolonizing the idea that black folk are not human enough. I will end here for my portion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bawache Bawatan. And, and please take uh, accept my apologies for mispronouncing your name the first time around, but it is Bawache uh, Bawatan. Um, and thank you uh, for giving us much to, to, to think about this afternoon as we look forward to our conversation all together here. Um, I also then what I want to to welcome um, and hand the, the floor over to our second esteemed guest uh, this afternoon, Dr. Denai Mupotsa. Um, Dr. Mupotsa, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm hoping to be, it's the end of the day for me. So I'm hoping I'm, I, I'm not feeling or don't sound too worn um, as I share some reflections. I've tried to take some notes, um, but I don't have a presentation. Um, but I think my reflections today, um, it comes from, a, I guess, a range of events, experiences, incidents, and archives um, that I'm thinking with over quite a bit of time. And I think in the present, and in particular, the way that Black Lives Matter comes to signify in particular kinds of ways in the context I'm speaking of. So and on the one end, um, so strategies, for instance, around collective justice, collective healing justice being increasingly um, investigated and thought about across various kinds of collectives of queer and feminist activists on the continent um, who for in the range of ways that they mobilize um, whether they're living in contexts where they can legally operate or not um, the kinds of work people have been doing over time has led to extraordinary amounts of burnout um, and in particular the kind of NGOization of so the social movements in different kinds of ways and capacities um, in different African contexts means a particular kind of use of the body and a, and a performance of the body and an engagement with, with political questions, but also trauma that means that a healing justice framework that has become part of the register of Black Life Movement is, uh, is 
appealing. And so there are there's that one register in my mind um, in terms of points of connection or points for reflection. And then the other part that I'm thinking of, of course, is my location as a university teacher um, at a university in the context of ongoing and enduring protests around access. Access signifying, um, you know, a kind of call for free quality decolonized education, coincidence with, you know, the questions around the canon, around the curriculum, around the pedagogy of our practice. And, and so we see a kind of heightening of protest movements since 2014 gathered around um, hashtags, uh, gathered around um, both the use of the body that's, I think, um, within genealogies of protest or the figure of the students in particular across South African history as a kind of site for in of intensity in terms of engaging with the state, um, certainly since the introduction of the Bantu Education Act in 1953, which consolidated um, a legal infrastructure um, that would ensure that black people would have a an education that prepared them for servitude in principle. Um, and so movements around transformation, I think, need to be located in that long historical durée, but also even prior um, to the university's lives um, in terms of how the university or the notion of science or the management of the colony in what is a slavocratic society um, have have been have constituted. So there was this move, this set of movements that emerge, and within them, multiple other kinds of movements emerge, and, and, and across them, blackness as a kind of site of intensity um, is important in, in terms of the context of its own emergence as a way to consider not only the experience of one's own body um, and also representations of that experience um, or the kind of feeling of a wrong, you know, so it's so, a so kind of a feminist consciousness or a consciousness of one's blackness um, that challenged the kind of forms of universalism that untransformed white institutions have had. And also to keep in mind, so we see 2014, uh, historically white universities come to see this protest around access. Um, but these protests had been part of the life of universities since the beginning of democracy, the historically black universities. And so the public university in general um, is at a point of kind of deep, deep crisis and potential collapse, um, increasing fees, um, increasing number of private institutions, um, an increasing description of the work we do as research rather than teaching, um, which I think all fold into the terrain of a kind of the success of the neoliberal university. So this is kind of, these are the kind of contexts that I bring. And I think at the beginning of this year, then another way, so I guess to go to the beginning of this year as an event, and then I'll go to um, the middle of last year uh, and to go towards some thoughts. At the beginning of this year, the university force had secured its borders. So in the, we've seen high levels of securitization. They refused to call it militarization, but we have multiple private security companies, fingerprint and, you know, borderline give your blood at the border security. Um, as And then sort of in high being closed. So in the context of COVID-19, part of the logic around it is that that um, this is in fact to keep us safe from infection um, and to protect all the members of the community. Um, there's also access confined of course, by everyone has to be online in a context that is also in the case that ourselves included as teaching staff for where students arrive at the university may never have even opened a computer in their lives. So, so this question of access and the divide and also the security of the university um, has these kinds of levels. So the year begins and like usual, protests emerge around a historical debt and students not being allowed to register. And because the security is so tight, students are forced off campus. And so being forced off campus means that they were now vulnerable to the state police, as well as the several private security companies operating in the city outside of the university on their behalf. So early in March, we see a young man, his name is Ntozi Sintumba, who was leaving a shop as students were running away from police who were shooting live ammunition at them. He was shot and killed. And so following his, his killing, um, what happens, of course, is in a kind of scandalous abuse of language. As he an executive team tells us he suffered fatal wounds 
um, or that there's an, a civilian who was caught in the crossfire. And so even the agency of him suffering the wounds as opposed to the responsibility of the various actors um, and the use of live ammunition on unarmed students, even framing him as a civilian in a state of that is not at war, are all kind of deeply problematic and contentious issues. And of course, the use of the police and that kind of form of use of violence has been also a feature of a lot of what people in social movements, movements around um, access to clean water. In fact, again, in recent protests um, in the Western Cape, people have had extraordinary force used on them um, in protest because water is now being privatized to the extent that you cannot collect rainwater. So community organizers protesting this, of course, facing the police. The use of police um, at, at various levels of, of the local has been a feature and I think most recently was considered to be a feature of the, the you know, the, the democratic state um, at Maricana when minors were shot by the order of the president um, for protesting. And of course, South Africa being, South Africa's economy is one that's reliant on a mining industry. Um, and in fact, at the height of the lockdown during COVID-19, the people seem to be the most urgent and most viable workers who were forced to continue to work with those working in mines. So this is all structured into a, the deep racial capitalism of the state itself. And so, so to go to, so there are all these conditions around which the politics of social movements across different kinds of territories, around which blackness is, is, a, is, is a consolidates a practice of culture in the sense of the practice of thinking through the historical, social, real, <laughs> lived experiences of what it means to be confronted by various systems and relations of power. It's contested territory as you know, around which class and gender and, and sexuality all occupy this kind of site of intensity in both, you know, in struggles that are connected in various kinds of ways. But I think also I want to point to that it's also in the frame of culture that is located in how we understand protest itself. And so whether it's the nature of song or the nature of um, a dance or a march, that that so that that it bec blackness becomes becomes a set of registers around which um, social forms of social resistance across historical times and the ways that they reference and. Um, the way that coalitions are formed or broken, the way that forms of memorialization um, function to disrupt the state's insistence on particular forms of memorialization that would otherwise um, consume them into simply being symbolic um, representations of, of a kind of um, enduring freedom. This also shows up around questions around the curriculum, around knowledge, and, and then, of course, around ways that, you know, blackness is a particular site of intensity. The second the moment until I come to my concluding thoughts is around is around a song. Um, so in, during at the height of a kind of very serious lockdown last year, um, several things happened and that were coincident also with Black Lives Matter protests as they begin in Minneapolis um, and around police violence. So several young men are murdered in police custody during that time and people start to, be, to begin to have conversations around our knowledge of the names of people in other in, in the united states in particular who have been killed at the hands of the state police and the and are not knowledge so certain kinds of idioms start to to appear in, the, in this comes back to i guess the comments i was making on culture so the use of the face um, the portrait, the name as a particular kind of strategy to give, to bring life to, in the case of Mtozisi, um, for instance, um, one of the acts of memorialization that emerged immediately was that people went on Google Maps and renamed the street where he was killed um, after him, um, as well as, <laughs> um, you know, putting up a new sign. And so, so the state may later come and claim that, in fact, this is a strategy, for instance, but, you know, university buildings being renamed by students and then the university then takes the credit as though it's gone through a legal formal process and not the pressure. Um, so this kind of, but the use of this, these idioms emerge at the same time as, you know, and the kind of iterative practice. So in pro, so a kind of what shows up in popular forms like music, you know, the use of the placard, the repetition of a hashtag, the taking up of particular items of Black Lives Matter that speak both to a reference of the United States, but also to very specific registers of social movements 
and their development in South Africa. And so thinking about that relation, I guess my final thought, um, I want to turn to something. I, initially, I thought about this around it, the, the feeling, the question of loss. My approach to loss initially was I came to in conversation around the humanities and transformation, literary humanities, and my recognition that for people who are monolingual, <laughs> and monolingual, I don't mean just the capacity to speak one language, but whose worlds are not uh, monolingual, the same, but they don't have to translate themselves constantly. As the loss of a kind of monolingual, mono secular humanism, or a kind of whiteness of institutions, the curriculum, the canon, is the loss of everything. If you don't have, we never been forced to learn other capacities of experiencing the world. Right. So that loss is then not registered as the loss of those who are conditioned by their by black struggle, but in fact conditioned by those who are then I was thinking to put imposing an I a notion around black common sense in the sense of um, thinking about the modes of mimesis or repetition that occur in different there are long histories of black internationalism, blackness in my mind is always been about a context of black struggle understood outside of the conditions of the nation state because of the various kinds of movements around that are we could call black internationalism. But in fact, how do we think about the relationships between us, which also include relations of power across nation states, around class, et cetera. So what are the conditions around which forms of using the similar or the same registers appear short of what do we know and not know, for instance, of the names of the people around us who experience the state's violence and part of I guess proposing black common sense is a way to think about the body's experience and what makes the world sensible to us. And so rather than it being a cognitive response of thinking through what people share across geographical contexts, to rather think about the world, the sense, sense making of the world for those of us who are black and how then it shows up in particular cultural formations or for, in cultural formations here, I return to this kind of idea of culture as a relation to, to struggle overall. So I think those are my comments and I look forward to further engaging with everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mupotza. Much appreciated for those comments. And we'll move on now to our third um, speaker and then we'll have um, perhaps a little roundtable discussion and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So I'd like to hand the floor over to, uh, to Dr. Caulfield. Welcome. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Caulfield. There you are. Are you with us, Dr. Caulfield? I am. I don't see the the I didn't realize I controlled the mute. I don't see the mute button. That, that's that's quite all right. We can all can, hear you, so please. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Sorry about Thank that. You. I didn't, no, no worries. Thank I didn't you. realize I was doing my own muting and unmuting. No so I um thank you so much. I'm really honored to be included on this panel, and I want to thank Patrick Barr for the invitation and Bozi Maposa mm -hmm. for her super efficient administration of this event, and especially now after hearing the first two presentations, I'm really thrilled to be speaking alongside these two distinguished scholar activists whose work straddles social action and theoretical analysis of blackness and Black Lives Matter as forms of local political consciousness and representation, as well as global responses to the dehumanization of black bodies. Because this context is especially relevant for Brazil. And I think the logic of including Brazil in the inaugural event in a series on Black Lives Matter as a global phenomenon at this particular moment seems self-evident. So Brazil is the nation that received the largest number of enslaved um, forced migrants from Africa, four to five million, 40% uh, of the total number of forced migrants brought to the Americas were brought to Brazil. Now, compared just to the United States, as a reference, uh, the United States received about 5% or 600,000. And 
Brazil also hung on to slavery until the bitter end. It was the very last nation in the Americas to free the enslaved population in 1888. So as a result, Brazil is the nation with the largest black population outside of Africa. It has 106 million black people, um, the size of the population is second only to uh, the black population is second only to Nigeria. And since the end of formal enslavement, there have been persistent attempts not, to not only dehumanize, but eliminate the descendants of these forced migrants, as well as the native population. And unfortunately, this is glaringly evident today. And I mean, like, today, as in between yesterday and today, as Brazil has registered a rec record number of deaths to COVID, over 4,000 Brazilians died of COVID yesterday. And also yesterday, public health experts projected that by May and possibly sooner, Brazil will lead the world in the total number of deaths surpass surpassing the United States. And really, Tragically, Brazil also surpasses the United States in relation to the disproportionate impact of COVID on the most vulnerable sectors of the population. And this vulnerable population is overwhelmingly black and indigenous. So COVID hit both of these populations during a period that was marked by the precipitous rise in state-sponsored violence and negligence. Indigenous and black Brazilians um, and activists were already characterizing this violence as genocidal um, in 2016, during the period of political crisis that led to a right-wing parliamentary, parliamentary coup in 2016. And this ended with the impeachment of Brazil's first female president. And that was 2016. So this same year, a Senate inquiry in Brazil found compelling evidence of state-sponsored black genocide taking the form mostly of police violence. Um, so black Brazilian activists have been warning of this genocide for many decades. Genocide was the way that the great intellectual Abdias do Nascimento characterized what he called the myth of racial democracy in Brazil. And Abdias do Nascimento elaborated this critique while he was in exile during the military dictatorship in the 1970s. And he saw this myth or this lie as a perverse ideological erasure of blackness and perpetuation of a cultural and physical whitening ideal. And then since the return to democracy after 1985, and I think this really resonates with the last presentation, black and indigenous activists have struggled to reverse this whitening process and also to reveal state complicity in the perpetuation and concealment one, I think earlier, but if there's another um, of racist violence, I would like to hear it. I'm sorry, something happened to the sound. No, it's quite all right, Sue Ann. I, I Can think you hear me? Someone, yes, yeah, someone had to, to mute themselves. So so go ahead, please proceed. Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I was just saying that after the return to democracy in the 1980s, black and indigenous activists have been trying to reverse this whitening process and to reveal the state complicity in the perpetuation of racist violence. And so on the one hand, activists emphasize state negligence and failure to provide equitable access to constitutional rights, such as the right to security, health, public services. And on the other hand, they highlight direct forms of state violence, particularly police violence. So for indigenous Brazilians, which most notably, though not exclusively, in forest areas, um, the populations are subjected to violence that's brought by illegal and unconstitutional exploitation of land and resources in their ancestral territories, as well as various forms of removal that included deliberate spreading of diseases and assassinations. And Black Brazilians, most notably, but not exclusively in poor urban neighborhoods, are subjected to a spiraling epidemic of violence by state security forces. And impunity for this violence extended from the time of the military dictatorship in the 60s and 70s to the present. But, but it's important to think about this, it, this is, it's not happening at a constant pace. And what seems especially tragic now is that racist violence 
has seen a really steep increase over the past few years. And this coincided with the election of far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, and it was a direct result of uh, the mobilization, the kind of mobilization he did during his campaign. So according to Amnesty International today, there's more police violence in Brazil than anywhere in the Americas, and 75% of killings by police are black men, most of them under the age of 30, in fact, most of them under the age of 25. And since the um, in 1906, uh, it's since in, in uh, 2016, a Brazilian Senate inquiry found evidence that justified um, the the concept of genocide in describing violence against the black population. Um, this starts to take you know even greater proportions. And numbers start rising significantly. So in the first six months of 2020 police killings of black civilians rose 7% in comparison to 2019 when rates were higher than the previous year. And to give some perspective for a US audience, police killing of black men take place at a rate that's at least five times higher than in the United States. And what's equally, I don't know if it's equally troubling, but also troubling, is that there's very little outcry on the part of Brazil's white population. Um, and there's near total impunity for the police. And in fact, one of the current president's campaign promises was to extend impunity to any police officer who killed civilians as part of their job. So it's really this very bleak context that today Brazilian, um, you know, within this bleak context, today Brazilian hospitals are on the verge of collapse and the public health system has been gutted. And this happened really, really quickly, just over a couple of years. So at this moment, Brazil has become the worst case scenario for COVID and for its disproportionate impact on the black and indigenous population. And what makes this all the more tragic is that Brazil was on a completely different trajectory over the past couple of decades. So as important as it is to recognize the failure to eradicate the legacy of colonization and enslavement and the modern history of racism, it's equally, maybe even more important to recognize a fuller history of blackness in Brazil that's not the same as a history of racism. So the history of black Brazil is an incredibly rich and multi-layered inspiring history of survival and resistance to dehumanization. And Brazilian social historians over the past 40 years have uncovered this history one, you know, almost one life at a time. And their work has led to a new understanding of the African diaspora um, and particularly the complexity and diversity of the human right, rights of these forced migrants and their descendants. Um, and I should just do a call out to one of these historians in um, uh, one of these social historians is Ohio University professor Mariana Dantas. Um, whose research offers this great example by showing how 18th century African-born and African-descended women managed to create and provide for their families and communities against all odds. So today, amid the horrors of the epidemic in Brazil, one of the few um, promising developments is the emergence of a really wide array of Black feminist activists and also indigenous women activists who've come um, together as these powerful voices in confronting and dealing with the crisis on the ground. So black feminist thinkers and activists frequently or, or really constantly reference the past, their ancestrality, um, and they emphasize that their presence is made possible by a long history of struggle. And so as they're interpreting the Black Lives Matter movement in the Brazilian context, they place this COVID crisis within a long history of genocidal public policies. And in the same breath, they reference ancestral sources of strength. So the, there's a, a mantra that's become really common across various Black feminist movements that is, our steps come from long ago. Um, and alongside their emergency responses, Black feminist organizations have supported local initiatives to fight COVID as part of this long struggle for political representation. And one of the um, elements in 
um, in this activism was to use the courts uh, for a variety, um, a variety of complaints of abuses that have come up with COVID. Some of them have to do with who's being identified as essential workers, whether domestic um, workers are essential workers and in what um, capacity. Um, another was a recent complaint by a variety of community organizers in Rio de Janeiro that was successful. It goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court last June prohibited police actions in poor black neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro during the public health emergency. And as remarkable as that decision was, even more remarkable was the immediate significant drop in violent deaths in those communities as a result of this Supreme Court order. So just to finalize, I, I want to mention another example, and that is the Marielle Franco Institute. So this is named for a black feminist city councilwoman from Rio who was assassinated in 2018. Her name is Marielle Franco. And what this institute and other organizations are doing right now is channeling an outpouring of solidarity in among poor communities into attempts to organize electoral politics. And the hope is that it will populate, this will help to populate post-pandemic governing bodies with what they call many Marielis, um, ensuring that the vulnerable populations are represented and that Marielis' struggle for justice continues. So I'll stop there, but I, I just wanted to note that there's so many, I think, really interesting overlaps with the other two presentations, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Caulfield, and also thank you again to Drs. Uh, Muputza and, and Boachi Rowatam for their contributions thus far. So we are going to transition now um, and allow our panelists to, to discuss some questions that came up among them and um, also include our audience as well. So if you're an audience member and you'd like to post a question, please do so in our chat function and I'll be monitoring that chat function and I will be very happy to pass questions on to our contributors this afternoon. Um, so are there any, any remarks uh, that our panelists would like to make uh, based on the presentations thus far? Yes, I, 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 I can start. Um, I, can, I, I, I want to try to tie all these, um, all, all the three different conversations in, in, in a single thread, if, if I could. Um, but I think that for most of these conversations, um, what is lost, and even for, for, for Black folk in the liberation movement, is that the, the ideas for which we resist today are so foundational that the resistance itself looks to be abnormal, right? That it is unfathomable for a lot of people to think about why are black people protesting? Why are they in the streets protesting? We give them everything. They are here. We, you know, um, there's freedoms everywhere. But they forget that when the founding fathers of this nation wrote about all men being equal, they were holding humans as enslaved. When the French were fighting the Haitians, they had already gone through the ideas of liberté, fraternité, liberté, and at the same time denying these ideals to these Haitians. What makes it different for a man to be free? or what defines freedom for certain people and not for other folks. And so it's it's becoming, for me, it's, it's set, the, the central thing here is that most people, especially white folk, have, 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 been, have been educated and they act to, to actually conceal the benefits of, 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 of racial privilege. So this concealment is what evokes this delirium. When, when, when black, black activists, native activists are saying that there is something wrong here, there is an immediate visceral delirium 
amongst white folk saying, oh, not necessarily. I mean, you can vote. What's the problem? And so there has been almost a deni culpable deniability about the sufferings of black and indigenous people across the world. And I'll talk about this issue is not only in the in in the uh, in, in, in in the advanced societies. This this is also happening amongst indigenous people themselves, amongst Africans themselves, especially for those who have crossed the boundaries of economic obstacles. Can, can I can I add um, a question and, and I'll, I'll, I'll use my my space as a moderator to kind of chime in here. Um, I mean, you mentioned uh, Dr. Bawachi Bawatam, you mentioned um, Haiti and, and you mentioned it in the context of a critique of, of enlightenment practices among sort of the white intellectuals and political leaders in the West in the 18th, 19th century, right? To what extent um, can we say that um, social justice movements are in fact making a claim to the enlightenment? That is to say that, that making a claim to fulfill enlightenment principles and in a way kind of reinforcing the very same enlightenment that in the original context subjugated black bodies and, and those of indigenous people and others. Right, so so it's complex, sometimes even contradictory, but there's a logic there, right? Yeah. Perhaps, and because I think of two, you mentioned Haiti, and I think of Toussaint Louverture, and and the Haitian revolutionaries, right, staking a claim to the very enlightenment that, in fact, was the context of their enslavement. Yes. So, if you could comment on that. Yeah. The, 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 so the um, the, there is a critique of enlightenment itself, right? That black bodies, indigenous bodies, non-white bodies continue to challenge the ideals of enlightenment because nothing of this is of reason, right? That the idea that this is a human, which is defined, and another body is completely eliminated from the consideration of being human. I, I don't know what is reasonable about that. So reason itself is very problematic when you subject blackness into, into your reason, right? It doesn't make sense. Unless you are telling me that what is human does not include me. And that is the fundamentals of this conversation that what is freedom itself has to be redefined. Because I think for Haitians, they redefined what freedom was. Where Americans were able to liberate themselves from, from British colonialism, Haitians, in fact, liberated themselves from slavery too. Right in the in the first Haitian constitution, it said slavery was abolished. America could not do the same, and so how do you and expand the ideals of freedom when not everybody is free? It doesn't even make sense, and that's what I think we're grappling with today. That the ideals of what is human, black bodies, indigenous bodies, keep challenging these parameters of what is human. And we are, we are, we are, in fact, reimagining and pushing the boundaries of what what Fernand calls a, a new humanism. Right? We need to think about human beyond the confines of Euro definitions. Thank you, Doctor Boachi. You're welcome. Um, any other thoughts, um, Sue Ann? I think. Well, I think it's interesting also to think to project the concepts of universal and enlightenment to a more recent period of human rights. And in the case of Brazil, as many other post-authoritarian constitutions incorporate universal human rights in particular ways. And for example, in Brazil, this is absolutely relevant to the Supreme Court case I mentioned that prohibits the police from actions in poor neighborhoods, particularly black majority neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro, as well as the indigenous rights to ancestral lands, um, as well as you know, black people's rights to ancestral lands of uh, maroon communities. These are all interpretations. So I think that you take enlightenment values that are limited and interpret them in ways that expands and that uh, requires recognition of particular groups and, and naming 
of particular groups. And that has been powerful, not because it's been implemented in any way and really fully. Um, so, you know, these rights exist on paper and then they're not enforced. However, they provide a means. So, you know, I think this example, a really interesting example of the Supreme Court in Brazil prohibiting police actions in Rio de Janeiro neighborhoods is an example of how um, activists can make use of once those, you know, once that's down on paper, they can use that as a way of pushing and pressuring. And it can sometimes be, uh, um, it can sometimes be uh, really effective. It can give, you know, lend legitimacy. Um, and the very denial of these rights also lends legitimacy to this larger struggle. Um, and I also wanted to, sort of related to this, I wanted to ask Denai to talk a little bit more about these acts of memorialization and naming, because this is also really significant in Brazil. And I mentioned Marielle Franco, who is a really good example of that, where the um, as you were talking, they took uh, street names and they they covered up street names and renamed streets for Marielle Franco. That was one of the campaigns. And another campaign was to feature her in the carnival parade. In a, um, and in the theme was about um, re-educating Brazil and telling the true history of Brazil. That's not the history that the history that they've covered up. And that was in 2019. Both of those campaigns were in 2019. Um, and so I, in thinking about this in relation to recognizing the US names of George Floyd and, and in places like Brazil where George Floyd's name is better known than all of the young men who are killed in Rio de Janeiro daily, you know, like 17 people in Brazil, 17 um, black men are killed daily by police. It's, you know, this epidemic and yet people don't know their names and don't pay attention. and so. That name recognition from the United States helps uh, to, to kind of build this movement within Brazil. So I guess I'm talking about two different things, but I, I somehow saw those as connected. I, I've been struck, and, and I think this I guess, speaks to what both of you have said. I, I'm struck by, because I'm, I think for those of us who are scholars, part of our habits, and I, and I was struck, I think, in the last couple years, um, in the sense, in the, the demand for explanation is also one of our habits. And this is what I think is connected to some of the, um, the contestations around, not only around history and memory, but also authority. Um, so for instance, looking to the example of um, thinking about, for instance, the Cold War as a particular moment around which particular forms of imagining or dreaming a post-colonial future are collapsed in, in certain ways. And so, you know, the, the trade union or other kinds of forms of mobilization um, are filtered into the state infrastructure. Feminist movements are filtered into state infrastructure in a kind of mainstreaming. And what that does, that depoliticizes them. And so the articulation of freedom in terms of the national narrative of it is marked by, you know, sort of notions of the individual capacity to own themselves. Of course, in a context where even that capacity of the self is is foundationally premised on the on the subjection of land to a property law as well as that of making people property. So that those slave codes and the laws at the foundation of kind of the inventing of the nation that make both enslaved people and land relations of property are also connected to the same conditions of freedom. So there's a kind of legal suturing of unfreedom even as freedom is articulated around rights, the rights of the individual within this human rights discourse, within the frame of what is human and good and the enlightenment. So I think when 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 people point to the failure of that capacity to be and know the world, then then the, the kind of explanatory, the desire for explanation is to mark the same history and events and say, well, this is what happened and this is what happened. And I think what's been happening in the last few years in terms of how people not only protest but also articulate dissent has made it difficult to to manage that that language to manage it within the same terms and so the explanations don't make sense so people talk about um 
well, you know, so I think blackness became a particular site. Are people borrowing this from some faraway place because it's not not the one we're talking about? And it's like, well, no. And, then, and I think that's why I'm 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 going back into into the condition of one's experience. I think there are habits and strategies people borrow. So it's strategic to know the law when you go out and you know don't have your identity document when you go out <laughs> because or do have your you know there's ways to know and mobilize and strategize in terms of like the logistics of of engaging the world just as much as the ID document itself is it's a foundational technology to to the racialized structure we're actually confronted with right um but i think what i think what 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 people are doing that is not located in an, in a desire for explanation is causing anxiety <laughs> because it's our problem as people who are who, who want <laughs> who want you know who want to name and not articulate and i think memory and history are both marked by these events at, with the assumption i think of progression or progressive time itself and so that dissonance i was in a class yesterday i was teaching poetry actually to first years yesterday and at some point they're like but it's a scam <laughs> you know history is a scam you know this 18 year olds mm -hmm. but the, the the resonance of of hearing it and it was simply the example of asking them to think of, of of Robin Island as the context by which um, enslaved women in you know from other parts of Africa were were arrested for you know for for a number of reasons in terms of their failure to comply with the conditions and the rules of you know like murdering I was giving the example of a of a refabrication a, a remembering of an archival court document of an enslaved woman who killed their child and was was arrested there for destroying someone's property, which is very similar to the kind of reconstruction of in Beloved, right? So I'm giving them this example, but they know Robben Island is about Nelson Mandela. So just that rupturing of historical time to think about the conditions of the present was enough to, to, to elicit a conversation about everything that's wrong from the foundations of their birth, <laughs> you know, in terms of how that, that their experience and how it's narrated never come to meet each other. And I think, that then this is, I think, the question of knowledge in itself is is at the heart of 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 even as activists work. They already know that they're being consumed by us, and so they have to move faster than us because they, they, that's also structured into the very conditions of of racialized violence in the world. Uh, fascinating exchange, actually, uh, Drs. Caulfield and Boacha Boatam and Mubutsa. Thank you for that. And may we turn to the audience for questions now. Again, audience members may post questions in the chat. Um, the first one, if, if uh, we can return to Dr. Mubutsa, um, um, you spoke about uh, perception by those um, uh, who uh, by those who aren't a part of the black community. Uh, what can I do as pardon me here? What can I do as uh, an, uh, not a person of color to better understand the struggles and issues um, that uh, the black community faces? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'm the authority on this. Um, I, I suppose that the stakes of undoing a kind of deeply unjust world for all of us i mean part of it is in relations of in power struggles there are times when people have to take power from those who have it and it's it's not going to feel nice in general and so that's got to be a part of it i i i across whether we're talking struggles around gender around sexuality around race i think that has to be part of what struggle means um i think that there are ways that we all experience power as a set of relations so they're all there are ways from our locations that we can understand and meaningfully engage the world so um i guess my sense would be what are the ways from one's own position can you become attentive alert to the ways you occupy or are able to move through or not move through space and then that attention might lead to a kind of way to diagnose conditions of power relations of power and be able to kind of unravel a kind of bundle of knots uh, but i think it has to be positioned all of our positions are multiple none of us are kind of a single relation of power on, you know so i i don't know if i'm the authority but i i would assume for everyone that we all sit where we sit in different cake different conditions of advantage and disadvantage and marginality and not marginality and it's a relational practice that I, I, i'm not the expert but yes <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, do our uh, other guests would like to comment? Um, if not, I'll move. I'll move to a subsequent question. Shall I? Um, the next. Uh, the next question. Um, a lot of people like to use um, the justification that police are within the scope of their duties when committing these atrocities against black bodies. And I think uh, this is obviously something that, that, that Professor Caulfield has talked about. And I, everyone here is sort of touching on this, this issue, particularly with cases like George, George Floyd, um, which further uh, dehumanizes the black individual. Uh, why is it so easy for people to rationalize the killing of black people? Um, he is seen as a big and dangerous black man and less of a human being. I just have a difficult time understanding why basic human rights um, are difficult to be afforded or understood in relation to black people. Um, I know that, that this is a theme that all have touched on here. So um, uh, please feel free to feel free to comment. I'll take a bite of this, um, Dr. Caulfield, um, if, if I may. Yeah, so I. You, you, when you think about, and I think James Baldwin talks about this, that blackness is an invention. And you invent something, you need to protect that invention. And you protect that invention by building institutions that carry on this invention. Blackness is an imaginative invention of whiteness. And so all the characterization of blackness is to make it racially subordinate to the idea of whiteness as the ideal of our humanity. And so when, when, you, encounter, when you encounter the other, there is, and in, in, in Bembe talks about this, there is an immediate delirium. As soon as you see black, black, blackness, the concept of it, it evokes something, and I don't think that people even understand why they are feeling this way, right? So that when violence is committed against the black person, the question is not, why, why did this person commit? The question is, what did the black, do, the black person do to attract this violence? And that narrative itself changes the posture of what, is, what blackness is, right? That blackness is always guilty, Blackness is always undesirable. Blackness, when it comes into contact with whiteness, needs to be subordinated, needs to... When you, when you see what um, the, the, the narratives that people post, the first thing they say, why did he comply? Right? There is an inherent idea that blackness is always supposed to be in a subordinated position. If you try to reverse that, the counter to that is always violence. And Fanon talks about this, that the world of the black man is a world of violence. And when you perpetrate black violence against blackness, even amongst blacks ourselves, when we perpetrate violence against ourselves, we feel amply justified to do that. And that, for me, is where we need to reverse. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, the, uh, it's, it's an uh, epistemic space in which we all exist. And that for me is, can only be countered with an epistemic deconstruction about ourselves as people, right? That, you know, if, if you are black, if you are white, if you are rich, if you are poor, as, as, as uh, Dr. Um, um, Mupoza was saying, how do you frame your space of existence? And what are your inherent complicity to these issues of inequities? I think adding to that, the, what we were talking about before, the idea of an enlightenment universal sets of rights and expanding what it means, what's the meaning of a human being. And in, when it's possible, to exclude certain people um, from that set of capacities and rights that sort of defines humanity, then their lack of humanity becomes more um, 
sort of ingrained into the society. So I'm thinking in relation to this broad array of rights, the capacity to um, the the capacity for for access to education, access to uh, economic means of survival and subsistence, and and ad, uh, the capacity to make a decent living. Um, and all of these are rights that are written into laws, in the case of Brazil, written into the Constitution in 1988, and yet systematically denied to a subsection of the population. And then that population, in a circular way, is dehumanized by virtue of their lack of access to these rights. And so when police are going into poor neighborhoods, what they see are drug dealers, what they see are criminals. Um, and that's, you know, uh, the other complication is the criminality of the police itself and their impunity. And so it's it's all part of this same um, complex of dehumanization of, of particular members of a, of a society. Um, and it's also intersectional. It's, it's um, racial as well as as well as gendered, but very deeply class and regionally oriented. And so that um, explains some activists in Brazil, but, um, Black Lives Matter activists talk about the police killings in poor neighborhoods, but they also talk about among the police who are killed, a large portion of them are also black men. Yeah, I just, I mean, a brief comment that the four police officers who were first arrested for the killing of um, Tozisi were given a bail that doesn't really, I'm trying to put it into US dollars, probably about $400, maybe 300. So I mean, a very, a very small amount of bail, they're back on the street working. Um, but also, I mean, imagine the conditions also of their own employment, which are, you know, underemployed, underpaid, driven, you know, the kind of, I mean, <laughs> the energy of, you know, policing, but also I think in general policing, if we, I mean, we, some people believe policing is a thing that not very many um, examples that I'm aware of where policing wasn't constructed with the very intention of protecting racial capitalism. So we should not be surprised that the police are trained to kill black people you know, across the world. So. I just wanted to just add a, a small point that this is related to also the ideas that take place in different, so there, the idea of white privilege um, building on what Agya was saying is so central to understanding how is it that people can not, um, not see the other as a human being. And there's an issue um, and the, the intersection of gender and race is so important to this because the relationship between, for example, domestic workers who are mostly black and their employers who are mostly white and of a higher social class is such that during COVID, the employers, many employers refused to release their domestic workers. They considered them to be essential workers or after the state actually said, no, domestic, that you can't have these women coming back and forth on buses. You can't, you know, this is, and, and the white families were then afraid of being infected themselves. Um, domestic workers were considered essential workers and therefore, I mean, were not considered essential workers except in specific circumstances. Um, but then the white families would make exceptions because of their personal relationship um, and ask them to come back as a special favor. And that kind of daily exploitation where you have somebody in your household whom the white family considers to be part of their family and yet an inferiorized part of their family um, is related to this um, the possibility of criminalizing and othering uh, a whole sector of the population without even realizing it. So, you know, many white liberal um, uh, people who might criticize police violence in poor neighborhoods don't recognize the violence that they're doing by reproducing these relationships within their homes. Um, and not recognizing this as part of the same violence, part of the same system that's upholding white privilege. So they would never say, oh my God, you know, I would never go into a poor neighborhood and shoot someone. And yet they are reproducing the, the system that creates that violence every day. Um, so we, we do have a question. Um, 
How does pan-Africanism fit within the global context of BLM when there are periodic xenophobic attacks in South Africa, uh, internalized anti-blackness in various communities, et cetera? I think, in other words, kind of problematizing where pan-Africanism might or might not fit within the context of, of BLM transnationally. I can start to try to tackle this. Um, I, I think that I think I I mean my sense in general <laughs> is that the the repertoires, registers, ability, the ways that people enter into conversations around black struggle not only borrow from ideas or ideals, for instance, including Pan Africanism. In, in in sometimes it's like very expertly, you know, like. I look at black internationalism for a living and this is how I understand it in this kind of intellectual set of traditions. And sometimes it's actually the name that gives me a sense of my own action, my own entry into political consciousness. I think those things are operating, which means there's different kinds of expertise in circulation. I think sometimes what, what doesn't translate or where contestations in relations of power appear, xenophobia is a very difficult one for me, and I'm a non-national, <laughs> I'm not. Na I'm a non-national South African. I'm a Zimbabwean citizen. I live in South Africa, privileged as a I have a PhD, I have a middle-class job. So I'm not speaking in terms of the conditions of what every other person who's living a kind of diasporic or migratory. But I, a lot of the times, there are a lot of ways. So, for example, people talk about Afrophobia. So the people who are attacked in xenophobic attacks are, are black people. It is not white foreigners. White foreigners called expats or tourists, I guess, <laughs> they are safe. <laughs> so that the, 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 I think the structuring conditions of anti-blackness have a lot to do with the relations between black people in general um, that normalize routine, the routine, routinized actions of violence on other black people, including violence that happens on also on South African citizens that ends up being also named as xenophobia. Um, this also, there are also ways that there are also forms of hierarchy that are difficult to name, but they they create, uh, that are related to class often, or um, mobility in certain kinds of ways that are difficult to name between black people. And I think a lot of, so I'm always reluctant to xenophobia as a frame because between black people, what's difficult for us to speak to each other about are also contestations of difference that are meaningful and have also been meaningful. Pan-Africanism was never seamless. People argued they did not like each other. <laughs> um, even to reference, it's not a space of like happy, joyful, you know, meaningful <laughs> agreement. These, these are not conversations of agreement. These are conversations of, of, of relations of power, of misunderstanding that I think operate across different, different frames of black worlds in the same way that you, um, a political action happens, say, so, or monuments. So, so let's say if one renames a building or renames um, uh, or, or engages with the memory of someone or repeats the memory of someone, Immediately, there are other people who recognize that claim of authority is problematic in relation to other people. These, are, this is what power means and how it operates. So, so my sense of it, my sense of how Pan-Africanism operates is that I think it's become a kind of elitist conversation located in, in in transnational institutions run by men. Every time I'm asked to speak about Pan-Africanism on a panel, it's men talking about the women they sleep with as you know, and it's fascinating for them, but not that interesting to me. When I try to talk about queer and feminist movements, for instance, using transnational networks to mobilize, I've been completely ignored in those conversations because they're not interested. And what they're interested in is trade and economic relations because those are more politically important. But of course, they're not because what it is is a circulation of elite experts. Um, and so, so I think that all of these difficulties are <laughs> occupying the space of our interaction with one another and I guess what we would rather what I would demand are more is more contestation rather than a, a, a withdrawal from the disagreement but actually to sit with it to sit with the discomfort and to sit with those differences because they are not simply ideological yeah, I, yeah let me let me chime in real quick Absolutely. I, you, you're right it, it's the Majority of the conversations we have from Pan Africanism, um, xenophobia, um, and I saw here about um, African descendants of slaves in the United States, an idea of internalized anti blackness. 
Um, it's not limited only to white folk. So that we've all gone through um, an epistemological process which has defined our humanity as something different from what we can identify with. So to be human means that you have to walk through the steps of Euro humanity. And as soon as you buy into that rhetoric, then you, as a black person, you could be anti-black too. Because then the question you ask is, why are you all not like me? Why are you all behaving the way you're behaving? And it's interesting that, and Fanon talks about this, when you exist in the zone of non-being, the way you resolve come, the way you resolve disagreement is through violence, right? So that you know, in South Africa, it's not rich people fighting or black people fighting white folk. No, their disagreement. If you if you have a disagreement with someone in the zone of being, you go to the court of law. If you have a disagreement with someone in the zone of non-being, you go to the streets and duke it out. And so we have been reduced to a non-human way of even resolving conflicts amongst ourselves. And I think my, the only way we can extricate ourselves from, from this conundrum is to re-educate ourselves from the ideals of whiteness, from the ideals, of, uh, um, ideals that has been placed on us by whiteness. Because we are all operating in these confused epistemologies. And until we extricate ourselves from it, these conversations will be forever. Because I'm not talking only about police brutality in the United States. We saw what happened in Nigeria against against Nigerian um, uh, Nigerians who, who were fighting against the um, the special police force, the special anti-robbery police squad, using violence against their own black bodies, right? So what makes it that we hate ourselves so much? That I mean, they've hated us for us to hate ourselves. I cannot understand that. And I think for, for us, I think, you know, all of us here is we need to dis disrupt this epistemic fundamentalism, which places white the whiteness, the idea of whiteness. I, when I say whiteness, I'm not talking about white people. I'm talking about institutions that seem so benign, but are so pervasive in our consciousness, deep consciousness. We need to begin as all of us here begin to disrupt this epistemological fundamentalism so that we can have other voices that are compelling, that challenge the basis of our humanity. Otherwise, there are too many people suffering and we're doing very little to alleviate those sufferings. Now I'm sounding like a preacher, I'm sorry. I think I think uh, all of us professors have a little preacher in us. Right. Um, I, we have one more question, if we can squeeze that in here and and uh, in it's uh, in addition to thanking all of you, uh, my my esteemed colleague uh, Mariana Dantas um, has the following question. And I'm sorry, uh, Professor Dantas, if I if I really paraphrase this, really make it kind of a lot shorter. Sorry about that. It's a complex and fantastic question. You can all see it in the chat as well. Um, she says that one thought that often troubles her um, is the zero sum game that's that's played when when speaking about um, um, race, uh, on particular on behalf of white supremacists. Um, that um, if there are improvements in the conditions of black lives, that there's some loss involved in the conditions of non-black lives, or in this case, white lives. Um, that's the zero sum game. So um, um, she's curious as to whether or not a, a human rights discourse can can crack through that. Um, but we know that's a power we, we that 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 is a powerful sentiment that she's putting her finger on here, and uh, we'd uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Um, oh, I can wait. Well, just quickly, I think that um, I think that the language, legal language, can be used when it's um, when it's a dialogue 
and when people are engaging with that language and pushing that language, and that's why the, the example of the Supreme Court decision, um, and there are several other examples of the ways that that language can be used and pushed and in ways that understand universal, but also understand the need to name differential access to rights and privileges. Um, and the other, I think that th this has already been said, but I think it merits underscoring, the recognition of all of our recognition of our subject positions and the extent to which we have relationships in which we carry um, certain kinds of privilege. And that's the work, that's really the work of um, of everybody, but in particular in relation to, um, to, to uh, violence against um, black bodies, it's the work of white people to recognize where their um, where their relationships of privilege are contributing to the reproduction of uh, inequality and contributing to the exclusion of certain peoples from um, access to rights. So I guess I think you can start with language and I think it's I think the language is really important and to have it written down is really important, but it's it's you know, it doesn't mean anything until it's actually used and put into practice. Um, essentially, the 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 uh, the imperative of, of decolonization and 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 uh, unpacking, right? Many of the assumptions uh, that that we that we carry with us, um, and we know we have a lot of students here, so we've used we've used sometimes some some words that they that they're not coming across yet in their readings, but they soon will as they advance in their studies. Um, but it's it's really about awareness and understanding that that uh, colonialism is is a mentality. And a discourse that far outlives um, the geography of colonialism, which comes to an end in the 60s, 70s, and 80s around the world. Um, that the conceptualization of it and what it is far, far um, exceeds just the geographical reality of what colon, um, colonialism was. So, I, you know, at, on that note, and to kind of put a put a kind of ribbon on all of it. Um, I want to thank you, the three of you, for for joining us, and I want to thank the audience for joining us as well. Um, we believe uh, that this series will, will um, be a successful one as we move forward. And uh, uh, our gathering today gives us that faith um, that uh, there are many who wish to ask questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody. There are still a couple in the chat, um, but there's great interest for this. And we at the Center for International Studies are honored and, and um, and, and, and really happy to, to be a place for these kinds of discussions um, as we move forward in trying to, as we say in our mission, um, try to make the world a better place. It seems simple, uh, but it's hard work for the individual and the collective. Um, so on behalf of everyone, thank you, Dr. Caulfield. Thank you, Dr. Boachibawatam. And thank you, Dr. Mopotza, for taking time out of your schedules to join us for this event today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, okay. keep your eye out on your email email inboxes. You always get stuff from the from.